Hello, um, English language students. This is the PowerPoint lecture on grammar for language frameworks. This is going to be split in half. Uh, there are 28 slides, so you'll be glad to hear that. Uh, so let's get going. OK, so just a quick reminder where we are with our language levels. Grammar comes after lexis and semantics, so it's anything above the lexical item up to the level of the sentence. Beyond sentence, we're talking about discourse structure. Um, remember that lexical item can be more than one word, as long as it's a single unit of meaning. Also, just a quick reminder that we don't talk about wrong, incorrect or bad grammar. We say uh, non-standard or dialect for non-standard. And we say standard for standard. We don't say good, right or correct. Grammar does not include punctuation. If you want to say something, if you notice punctuation, try and see what it's showing you about grammar structure. It's showing you something about clauses or it's showing you something about sentence functions very often. OK, so this is just a list of contents at the beginning and you can use these lists to revise from. So before you look at the PowerPoint, see what you can remember about each of these, see how well you can define them and exemplify them. So word classes, we do talk about under Lexis as well, but a quick reminder, the more detailed you can be in your labeling of word classes, the better. So not just a noun, but what kind of noun? Proper nouns are names that have capital letters. Abstract nouns describe states and feelings, and it, they're, not, they're not concrete. So a concrete noun, the easiest thing I would say is something you can actually draw or represent with a drawing, whereas abstract nouns are things like love, anxiety yeah things like that uh, verbs i use the terms active and stative i think you use dynamic either way absolutely fine uh, and don't forget stative verbs are verbs so not all verbs are doing words is be yeah they're still they're still verbs adjectives and adverbs which also can be described as modifiers adjectives modify nouns adverbs modify verbs although i came across one modifying a noun the other day so you know um, and with adjectives, the dif di distinction between a comparative and a superlative adjective. So a comparative adjective is when you have two things um, and they're both good, but one is better. Uh, and superlative is when you have three things. So they're all good, but one of them is the best. If you can't do the er uh and the est, you have to say more and most. Uh, more handsome, most handsome. Pronouns, the more sharply you can label pronouns, the better. First person singular, first person plural. There's a table in a minute to help remind you of that. Um, determiners will often help you spot that there's a noun phrase, but they can also sometimes help you say something about meaning. Uh, and conjunctions can help you identify whether you're looking at a compound or a complex sentence. So you could do that if you like, a little task. Uh, don't worry about that. So inflections, there aren't many inflections in English. Uh, they are word endings. Um, they do have meaning, but bound morphemes are not words. They have meaning, but they have to be put onto uh, another word. We have S to make nouns plural. That's the regular form. And we have ED to make verbs past tense. That's the regular form. There are irregular forms, as in children, not child's. So that's the personal pronoun table. OK, so um, it's always helpful. It's always good if you want to be able to very, be very precise about labelling your pronouns. So after words with inflections and things like that, we're getting up. The next in going up in size is to a phrase. Uh, a phrase acts as a single unit of meaning. It's built around a head word and that can be from any of the major word classes. A sentence can be made of a single phrase if it includes a verb. So, be on time is a complete sentence. It's also a verb phrase. Uh, other phrases do not make complete sentences, so a noun phrase on its own is not a complete sentence. Um, the big angry giant is not a sentence. Um, in three weeks' time is not a sentence, but it is a phrase. For A level, we will only focus on noun and verb phrases. If you want to go further, there is a link there um, to Cambridge. Um, and if it doesn't work, if you're watching this, obviously it will work if you go to the original PowerPoint on Teams. 
So verb phrases, verbs can be modified by adverbs and adverbials. I will explain what adverbials are uh, in the next slide or another slide. And ba basically they give more details about the verb, in what way the verb is being done. Verb phrases can also make use of auxiliary verbs and modal verbs. And these can create different tenses and what are called in grammar moods. Okay, so it's not, not to do with how you're feeling. So an auxiliary verb, auxiliary means to help. These verbs support the main verb to create these moods and tenses. They're often contracted, so they're not easy to spot. So I've coloured it in. I've eaten the cheese. The, the, the auxiliary verb have is supporting eaten to help make the tense. I have eaten the cheese. Um, the dummy auxiliary verb do is used to form negatives, questions, orders and for emphasis. So you can see each of those being done there. This is really helpful for child language development because this is one of the latest and last forms of grammar that children develop, unsurprisingly, because uh, it's quite complex. So children will often form negatives in more simple ways and they will form questions in more simple ways to start with. It's also worth noticing in older texts, they may form negatives and questions without using the dummy auxiliary verb do. It's, it's a Given the whole history of English, it's a latish development. So this is, as I said, we talk, we'd also mention adverbials. So adverbials are work as adverbs, but they're more than one word. And if you want to, and it might help you grasp adverbs, if you think about them doing four things. Adverbs can tell you more about the manner in which something has been done. These are the ones you're probably most familiar with. They end in ly a lot of the time. Um, but prepositional phrases are, can also be described as adverbs of place. So by the table, in the cupboard. Yeah, they can see how those start with prepositions, but altogether that's an adverbial phrase uh, because it's telling you more about the place. I found my hat in the cupboard. Uh, but you could, they can just be words like here and nearby. Quite often, if I can't guess what a word class is, I'm not confident what a word class is, I guess it's an adverb. And very, very often it is. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful or not. Uh, adverbs of time, later, yesterday, all day, usually. And adverbs of probability, perhaps, definitely, maybe. Uh, so just a bit more of that, <laughs> because it is complicated, but it is also worth commenting on if you spot it. So there's some examples of adverbs of manner. Uh, the children were playing happily. He was driving as fast as possible, which is a prepositional phrase. Uh, I saw him there. We met in London. Um, they start work at 6.30. They usually go to work by bus. So you can notice how often these start with prepositions. Perhaps the weather will be fine. He is certainly coming to the party. OK, hang on there. Um, modal verbs, really, really helpful to spot modal verbs. They mitigate power. Um, they help people sometimes, you know, disguise directives. Um, they tell us a lot about politeness in a text. Also, they can be very persuasive. So in the unseen texts uh, on paper one and on paper two, modal verbs are worth looking at. They express levels of possibility and probability. Uh, that's not the whole list, but that's a little list to remind you what modal verbs are. There's a worksheet in, uh, on Teams about modal verbs. Words like can, will, may, should, could, would. Uh, now, when you see a modal verb, it's, don't just stop there. The key thing is how strong or weak is that modal verb, because that can have a very big difference. Strong modal verbs often have a great deal of power and authority behind them. Weak modal verbs can um, be polite. So if you do have power, but you want to mitigate your power, you might need, need a weak, weaker modal verb. Or if you don't have a lot of power and you're trying to be persuasive. Ah, the lovely noun phrase. So noun phrases, um, they centre around a head word and that can be a noun or it can be a pronoun. Um, phrases can contain words which modify the head word, determiners, numbers, adjectives. So when it occurs before the head word, it's called pre-modification. When it occurs after the head word, the noun is post-modification and you can have both. So there's the example. The old modifies man and then with a gun. Very, very common for the post modification to start with um, a 
a preposition. You can also have noun modifiers. So not every word in front of a noun is an adjective. Uh, the school leavers prospectus. Yeah, in that case, the noun school leavers is modifying prospectus. Uh, and then we're up to clauses and sentences. So a sentence has to have a verb in to make complete sense. A, sen a simple sentence can be a single clause, but we can have more complex sentences than that. Um, in fact, a compound sentence is when you have two main clauses linked by or, but, and and. And then complex sentences have a main clause and a dependent clause, or you may have learned the term subordinate clause or embedded clause, one of those terms. Um, and I, I say which cannot exist as a sentence in their own right. Sometimes you look at them and you think, well, it could be. So it, it's hard. But basically what we mean is it's not the main clause, it's supporting the main clause. Often they have commas around them and you can see that you could take them out. Another way that you can spot subordinate clauses is often they could go at the beginning, in the middle or even at the end. Um, so the reason we want to spot complex sentences is uh, they make text more formal. They're more common in older texts. They're the last kind of writing that a child might develop to use complex sentences. Uh, you might find writers using minor sentences for effect. Um, and the quote that you can't quite read there says fog everywhere. And that was that was punctuated like a sentence um, by Charles Dickens at the beginning of Bleak House. So we called it a minor sentence because he knows what he's doing. He hasn't just forgotten to put a verb in. Oh, sorry, I'm going to stop.